Social Amnesia by Russell Jacoby. This is chapter seven, which is the last chapter. Theory and Therapy Two: Lang and Cooper. No less than has the political left, the psychology of R. D. Lang and David Cooper and their co-workers, has not been immune to subjective reductionism. A reductionism, which in particular has lost the tension between theory and、uh, therapy. Again, a preliminary problem: if it is unjust to discuss the pol- political left as kindred to the non-political conformist psychologies, it is equally unjust to include Lang and Cooper. The intent of their psychology is political and critical. The psychology of madness seeks to indict, not absolve, a maddening society. Their work seethes with discontent. In this, as well as in their serious philosophical interests, they radically diverge from the conformist psychologies. Yet they do not escape the general fate. Though their thought genuinely resounds with political radicalism, revolutionary elan. And theoretical coherence, yet it finally dribbles into blind therapy and positivism, pop existentialism and mysticism, to the point that neither they nor their admirers appear to notice. It might not seem to matter, yet it does matter. The critique of society is degraded to externals against the inner drift of their own work. Over time, this inner logic takes its toll. On Lang and Cooper, and on their followers, the critique, unable to sustain itself and hollowed of meaning, is a front for establishment psychology, political passivity, spiritualism, and so on. The intention of the following is neither to sum up nor write off Lang and Cooper, but hopefully to be suggestive. Their work is itself unfinished, and it is uncertain how they are to resolve the antinomies. In which it is locked, in so far as their work is incomplete, so too are these remarks. Finally, it should be emphasized that while no distinction is drawn here between Lang and Cooper, this does not mean that they are identical. Furthermore, attention will not be directed towards some of their co-workers, especially Aaron Esterson, who in some ways is closer to Lang than is Cooper. The justification for limiting. This discussion to Lang and Cooper is found in their theoretical closeness, the relative abundance of their writings, and their general impact on a wide audience. As elsewhere in this book, the critique does not claim universal truth, but neither does it seek to be simply defined by and restricted to the names under discussion. At issue are social and intellectual tendencies. From the first, Lang and Cooper have repudiated the regressive principle of the post-Freudians, that of the discontinuum between health and sickness, and in doing so have returned to a Freudian position, the essential unity of psychic phenomena. Yet this must be immediately qualified. In their most recent writings, the disunity has been maintained in the reverse: the mad are sane, and the sane mad, and both are located in distinct camps. This in turn reformulates in reverse the bad identity of therapy, and theory, that is the mark of the post-Freudians. The latter naively identify individual and group therapy with social change. Lang and Cooper, on the other hand, openly in opposition to society, in flipping over the conventional designations of health and abnormality. Reproduce as a mirror image the same identification of therapy and social change. They tend to equate individual psychoses and madness with social liberation. They invest in the former, what can only be reached by the latter. Hence, the noticeable glorification of schizophrenia, especially in politics of experience, as a natural healing process, an existential birth, or rebirth. Sorry, existential rebirth. Lang and Cooper succumb to unresolved and unconscious contradiction, which they do not, like Freud, articulate. Rather, in presenting them as transcended, they fall prey to them. We are told that schizophrenia is a special strategy that a person invents 
in order to live in an unlivable situation. Yet the content of this unlivable reality is whittled down to that of interpersonal relations, especially of the family. This was precisely the drift of the Neo-Freudians. The social structure was adulterated to social friendship patterns. There are no schizophrenics, Cooper tells us, and further the conventional method of abstraction in which the schizophrenic is considered removed from the system of relationships in which he is caught distorts the problem. While there are sufficient statements designating the family as a mediating agency between society and the individual, in the main it is accepted as the cause of social oppression and not also its victim. The critique of the process of abstraction, considering the schizophrenic in isolation, issues into another abstraction, the family as an insular group. What Marcuse wrote of therapy among the Neo-Freudians can be reformulated for this context. That the family is abstracted from society in the name of therapy aimed at a schizophrenic, embedded in the family is not questioned. This is a pragmatic decision to be discussed among specialists, i.e. when or where individual or family therapy is more productive. It only becomes a question when this procedure of abstraction is promptly forgotten and the family is considered society and not also its damaged product. When family therapy is billed as social change, the imperatives for social change itself disappear. An either or is posed here, which Lang and Cooper and radical therapists shy away from, but which is not arbitrary. Rather, it is rooted in the social structure. The social and radical analysis suggested that the individual des designated mentally ill is ill not from personal defects, rather the illness is a response to an unlivable situation that can be traced through the mediation of friends, family, jobs, and so on, to society. When one is loyal to this analysis, there can be no talk of therapy. More precisely, there can be talk of therapy, but therapy as therapy not as radical therapy or social change. The therapy accepts for the sake of the individual victim the disjunction between the, indi the individual form of the illness and its social origin. In this way, therapy becomes self-conscious, adequate to its own notion. It does not mystify itself as radical cure or liberation while it responds to the emergency of the individual victim. But radical therapy is not loyal to the political and social analysis. It often confuses interpersonal family and social analysis. Out of the confusion emerge possibilities of therapy as birth, healing, growth that society precludes, if indeed society is even remembered. Rather, it is often forgotten by way of existential jargon, or it is spiritualized away by a new religious ethos. The former participates in all the difficulties of existential and humanist psychology, some of which were indicated above. With Cooper, especially in the death of the family, a radical individual existential standpoint coexists with an equally radical communal one. Commitment to oneself is as evenly accentuated as commitment to the community. Yet it is the very source of the evil that in bourgeois society, the necessities of the individual and those of the collectivity diverge. To attain their identity in a free society presupposes the enunciation of their present antagonism. Cooper, however, unconscious of the contradiction, perpetuates it. To follow him insofar as the family violated the integrity of the individual, the duty of the individual is first toward him or herself. The only way to, compa to compassionate involvement with others is the shortcut of one's own liberation, Cooper writes, as if this were not the very jingle that bourgeois society monotonously plays. The shortcut of individual liberation cuts short the social liberation without which the individual is shunted into a dead-end street. Cooper relates an existential tale of a Japanese poet who chooses to pass by a small, desolate, abandoned child because responsibility toward himself and his journey is of greater importance. The moral of this tale, the hardest lesson of all is to know what one has to do for oneself. Such is the blank existentialism that fantasizes it is negating bourgeois society, 
even as it heeds its first precept. Abandon the abandoned in the name of self-help first. Yet this is not the whole of Cooper. Existential individualism vies with the communal and collective ethos. The contradiction is not merely Cooper's. It is one of an unfree society. The point is to find it and say it. To pretend that one is the other is to promote the myth that personal liberation is either personal or liberation. The only shortcut is via the detour of social and political praxis. The thought of Lang and Cooper is nourished by various intellectual traditions of which two stand out. One, a neo-positivist social psychology and sociology focused on the group and group dynamics. And two, a European philosophical existentialism centered on the concrete existing individual. While these two traditions may seem incompatible, they converge in a single concern, the individual and his her immediate context. In different language, interpersonal perception, intersubjectivity, both traditions repudiate the study of the individual abstracted from the context of other human beings. Both stress the network of concrete human relations. Both, however, ultimately work to eat away the social context of these human relations. They reduce social relations to immediate human ones. The study of group dynamics within sociology or psychology is hardly new. It derives from an American as well as a German tradition, from Charles H. Cooley, as well as from George Simmel and Kurt Lewin. Sociology itself has often been defined as the study of how social groups influence each other and their members. The attraction of this approach for establishment sociology is not difficult to discern. As Adorno and Horkheimer comment, the concept of society disappears to make way for endless empirical observations on group dynamics. These empirical observations skirt the antagonistic relationship that is outside the laboratory, the individual and society, in favor of the safe, sound, and verifiable one of individual and individual. With Lang and Cooper, the group dynamic approach is extended to the study of schizophrenia. The promise is to understand schizophrenia by situating it in its immediate human context, usually the family. Our interest, writes Lang with Aaron Esterson, is in persons always in relation either with us or with each other, and always in the light of their group context, which in this work is primarily the family, but may include also the extra familial personal network of a family. This method seeks to study at one and the same time, one, each person in the family, two, the relations between persons in the family, three, the family itself as a system. The claim is that the shift of view from considering schizophrenia abstracted from a context to situating it within the family has an historical significance no less radical than the shift from a demonological to a clinical viewpoint 300 years ago. The shortcoming is that from the standpoint of theory, society is shuffled out the shift of viewpoints issues into the very problem of the study of group dynamics in general. A social constellation is banalized to an immediate human network. It is forgotten that the relationship between you and me or you and the family is not exhausted in the immediate. All of society seeps in. If it is clear that the immediate relationship of boss and worker, teacher and student is grounded in a non-immediate social configuration, it is no less true of family relationships. Society as the determining structure dictates more than the husk of a relationship. It cuts into the living germ. Lang and Cooper are aware of this, but only aware. The awareness is not translated into theory, but remains on the level of continual observation. The contradiction that inheres in all therapy turns into an antinomy. If the family is the immediate context of schizophrenia, it is not the context, society. Inasmuch as the limitations of family therapy are not acknowledged, the therapy begins to confuse itself with social change. Yet the very material itself, the case history is presented, shows to what degree the family, if it is the immediate situation for schizophrenia, 
is only one part of the whole situation. The question which is implicitly posed by the family analysis of the child's schizophrenic is the origin of the parents that caused the schizophrenia. Evidently, they emerged from other families, themselves caught in other networks and so on. Society enters by the back door. The family analysis pushes toward its limits. The facts discovered during the analysis in suggesting that the family itself is victimized confess that family therapy is insufficient. Neither of Lucy's parents had emerged from their relations with their parents as persons in their own right. Both had been hopelessly immersed all their lives in fantasy unrecognized as such. Or Mrs. Church herself had been subjected to her own 400 blows, leaving her, as one report put it, an empty shell. Understandably, and indeed necessarily, Mrs. Church tended to destroy not only her own inner world, but Claire's. The and indeed necessarily captures the whole dynamic of society. The problem is not that family analysis and therapy are being used. It is that therapy does not attain self-consciousness, lucidity as to its scope. Because the tension between family and society, theory and therapy dissipates, social theory and change are absorbed by family therapy. The unadmitted tension between the theory and therapy takes its revenge. The therapy, conceiving itself as dealing with the real context, inches out to include more and more people in this context, and finally is damned to impotence, confronted by more people than any therapy could hope to treat. Because the disjunction between society and family is neglected, the specific praxis suitable for each is rendered an amalgam suitable for neither. Lang cites with approval the therapeutic approach of a doctor whose strategy was to reconvene the network out of which the mother had dropped in the past 20 years, eventually bringing together at one meeting upwards of 35 people, representing elements of no less than seven nuclear families. He did not treat the son or the mother individually or as a dyad, but treated the whole network. The absurdity of this approach is based on the illusion that the therapist can reconvene the whole network of which the patient is a part, and secondly, even if it could be done, that these numbers of people could be treated. The question, of course, is why stop with 35 people, since they are evidently involved with another 70, and so on. The implicit logic suggests the project of gathering all the members of society in one room, as if the antagonisms could be ironed out in the give and take of a group discussion. Objective conditions are refined into bad vibes. At times, Lang has suggested that the entire world is an expanded family group, what he calls a total world system. Truths adequate for family therapy degenerate into naive political pronouncements on East-West relations, passed off as a family tiff. If there is a recognition of a distinction between family and society, the distinction is reduced to one of complexity, complexity, not of kind or structure. New elements and a new gestalt to enter into the larger pattern with that proviso. It seems that our scheme of the dyadic spiral for the interplay of true perspectives has relevance in the international sphere. The relevance is shown in the advice as to how to avoid an East-West conflagration. If West thinks East thinks that West thinks that East thinks West is going to move first. The West, etc., etc. Fuck, dude. Forgotten is that society is not identical with a family. Nor social relations with human relations. Capitalism is not merely numbers of people in... <coughs> <coughs> involved in groups and families. A collaborator of... <coughs> a collaborator of Lang, Aaron Esterson, sums up the humanist reductionist principle thus. <coughs> a social system is simply the pattern of interaction and inter-experience of the persons comprising it. This is inexact. It is also a social construction 
and constriction, which, if it is derived from human labor and activity, in turn dominates them. It is objective as well as subjective. A radical analysis of schizophrenia is committed to society as the determinant. Evidently, the mediations are crucial, and the family is one of them. But they are mediations, not origins. The family does not exist in a no-man's land. It is snarled in a historical dynamic. It has changed in the past, and it is changing now. It is as much victim as victimizer. The reduction of a social configuration to a concrete and immediate one explains a striking feature and irony of much of the radical and existential psychology, the omission of a class analysis of mental illness. While there are unending comments and accusations that society is the villain, society is conceived either in immediate human terms or abstract universal ones, or both. In the former case, the agent of oppression is the family and network of friends, and this is interpreted as invariant throughout society. In the latter case, society is the direct cause and is pictured as a universal and homogeneous uh, substance. In both cases, attention is deflected from decisive mediating agents such as social class. A vacant existentialism or a vapid social analysis blocks a finer investigation sensitive to class. The possibility and probability that certain kinds of mental illness are more prevalent in one class or stratum, or in families of that class, are ignored. The irony is that while the radicals have been indifferent, a class analysis of mental illness and of mental illness in the family forms a viable part of liberal social psychology. The point here is not to renounce family therapy or group therapy. It is to realize to what extent even the most extended therapy remains therapy. A choice in how to treat the individual that leaves untouched the social roots. In that sense, there is no such activity as radical therapy. There is only therapy and radical politics. Need it be said, there is no shame in aiding the victims, the sick, the damaged, the down and out. If mental illness and treatment are class illness and treatment, there is much to be done within this reality. But the reformation of the social reality is another project, which, if it is not utterly distinct from therapy, is not to be confused with it. <clears throat> the question of the use of a medical or biological analogy in psychology can serve as a final clarification of the theory-therapy dialectic. Lang and Cooper, like many others, protest the use of such a model because it mystifies the social and human processes within psychology that are non-existent in non-psychological medicine. The very diagnosis and definitions in psychology enter into the dynamic of the situation differently than strict medical terms. For example, a medical diagnosis of tuberculosis, even an incorrect one, does not affect the disease, while one of schizophrenia may cause schizophrenia. The definitions, the doctor, the immediate human context specify the milieu of psychology differently than in non-psychological medicine. This is undoubtedly true, but insufficient. The critique of a quasi-biological psychology in the name of society forgets that biological medicine is not outside the social dynamic. Clarity here could illuminate the theory-therapy relation that exists in both spheres, psychological and non-psychological. The biological model contains a truth if it is freed from the mystification that removes it from history and society. The critique of the biological model <clears throat> lags behind a vast amount of critical literature that shows that not only medical care, but medical and biological diseases and disorders themselves are subject to a social dynamic of class, stratification, and so on. If this be so, the theory-therapy dialectic can be pursued, as it is valid in both dimensions, without, however, losing all distinction between the psychological and the non-psychological. Each dimension possesses a specific as well as a sh Each dimension possesses a specific as well as a shared relationship to society. 
The discussion in Chapter 3 of the Social Manufacture and Perception of Automobile Accidents can be reconsidered in this context. <clears throat> accidents are more than accidents from the vast numbers of accidents on the job to occupational diseases. They are embedded in a social configuration. So too with most diseases and sicknesses, from colds to infant mortality to malaria. None of these is randomly distributed in populations. They possess a social content. Chronic disease, for instance, is not a biological statement about the poor. It is a social statement. The fact, however, of the social origin does not preclude treatment on an individual basis. The reverse is true. Treatment on an individual basis must proceed at the same time that the theory suggests that the ailment and ultimately the cure is extra individual. The victim of an automobile accident is not to be turned away by the politically aware doctor with the remark that he or she is not a victim of a specific car accident, but a victim of an obsolete transportation system kept alive by the necessities of profit. Both are true and both are to be preserved in contradiction. The emergency of the individual is to be attended to, even as it is traced to non-individual and social factors, which are the real source. The situation of the doctor treating schizophrenia is in principle not dissimilar from that of the doctor treating black lung diseases or automobile accidents. While there is neither identity nor complete separation between the psychic and the somatic, the disjunction of theory and therapy is valid in both. The therapy in each leaves untouched the social roots, which does not mean that the therapy is unnecessary. The damage from accidents, psychic and physical, need to be healed. The battered driver is to be cured so as to return to the expressways, this time to die. Psychic tr transfusions are to be given to the schizophrenic, so that he or she can be released into the madhouse called society. This contradiction is contained in therapy of each kind. It is to be elucidated, not veiled, as if some new treatment, be it for broken bones or broken souls, can magically escape from it. What Lang and Cooper tend to forget is that if family and extra family therapies progress over clinical therapy and analysis, this is progress in therapy, not in social theory or praxis. The concentration on the family nexus that Lang and Cooper advocate entails a concentration in the dimension in which this operates. The present communicative interaction of the family. The analysis proceeds on the plane of communication and the breakdown of communication, metacommunication and lack of communication, spirals of misunderstanding. The analysis uses terms such as expectation, validation, confirmation, and perception, uh, terms which, su which suggest communication in its verbal and nonverbal forms. The drift of the analysis is not distinct from that of the neo and post Freudians. It ignores the psychic depths and the past for the present and accessible interhuman dynamics. It advances the same critique of psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis leaves out the social analysis. Psychoanalytic theory has no constructs for the dyad as such, nor indeed for any social system generated by more than one person at a time. Psychoanalytic theory has therefore no way of placing the single person in any social context. As with other Freud critiques already discussed here, the social that is then added is simultaneously flattened out this time to become communication. The, weakness, the weaknesses of the communication and interaction formulations are the weaknesses of common sense and Adlerian psychology. It is not that they are completely untrue, but that they are superficial. Further, they become the more untrue, the more the, the surface analysis drives out the, the past and psychic dimensions. Increasingly, this seems to happen. The family appears more and more as a power group, and schizophrenia is simply a product of mismatched roles, expectations, messages, and so on. The family invents schizophrenia, or schizophrenic symptoms are virtually whatever makes the family unbearably anxious 
about the tentatively independent behavior of one of its offspring. Or schizophrenia is considered the product of preconceptions and expectations. Hence, Lang suggests that an experiment in which a group of schizophrenics would be treated as sane and a group of normals treated as schizophrenic would show that expectation causes the disease. If in Freud, neuroses and psychoses are rooted in an erotic and infantile past and hence are completely or only uh, partially eradicable, here they are dependent on the flow of communication. The communication models implicitly accept a parliamentary notion of reality where there are no real antagonisms. In the official accounts, all conflict and different all conflict and differences are traced to breakdowns in communication, as if real contradictions did not exist. The same notion is stated or implied by much of the communication theory of psychoses. Repression and antagonism are sublimated to become mixed and confused messages. Hence, in Gregory Bateson, who pioneered this approach, and on whom Lang and Cooper draw, the ego function is described as the process of discriminating communicational modes. In schizophrenia, we must not look for some specific traumatic experience in the infantile etiology. The specificity for which we search is to be at an abstract or formal level. Again, the point is not that these formulations are inaccurate, but, but that they are superficial. If within therapy, a communicative approach is effective, this is not questioned. What is questioned is when an effective approach within the treatment makes claims to be more than a description of current processes. A breakdown of communication is more than a breakdown of communication. It is rooted in other tensions and antagonisms. Communication is a moment of existence, not the whole of it. The confusion between the surface and the essence leads Lang and Cooper to make the elementary bourgeois error. They mistake the phenomenon specific to one historical era as universal and invariant. In brief, they take the human relations that prevail in late bourgeois society as human relations as such. In this, they share the illusion of the role psychology is discussed in Chapter 3. Role behavior is passed off as human behavior and not as a degraded form of it. What Lang and Cooper barely broach is that the interpersonal relations that proceed exclusively in the track of images, confirmations, metaconfirmations, and so on are already an alienated mode of behavior. They represent the behavior and communication of the disintegrated ego. When Lang writes that human beings are constantly thinking about others and about what others are thinking about them and what others think they are thinking about the others and so on, he neglects to add the crucial qualification. Not all human beings, but human beings who have been mesmerized and mutilated. Human beings seek double and triple confirmation when the first fails and the first fails when the ego that advances it fails. The ego, frightened over its own fragility, seeks endless confirmations it can neither give nor receive. The logic of human relations approaches the logic of paranoia, and every nook and cranny lurks danger. Confirmation hardly allays the fears. One needs meta-confirmation and meta-meta-confirmation. What I think you think of me reverberates back to what I think of myself. And what I think of myself in turn affects the way I act toward you. This influences in turn how you feel about yourself and the way you act toward me, and so on. And so on. The task is endless, without escape or exit. In the prison of mirrors, which is society, the lifers stare at the mirrors for signs of life. Multiple reflections are the opium for the multiple wounds the ego has suffered. This is not to argue that in a future in human society, confirmations and metaconfirmations would not exist. They undoubtedly would, but they become an exclusive pastime in a society where the ego is profoundly injured. Total confirmation is an imperative where total insecurity is a reality. Knots become the form of human discourse when the social noose is gagging the individual. This is the joyless reality, but it is also the facade, a facade because it is a reflection 
of an objective social reality that is hidden from view. The theory of interpersonal perception is the theory of the spectacle. The effortless shift in Lang and Cooper from a stress on the real and interpersonal context of human relations to a symbolization of this context from an existential reality to what sounds like a positivist one, which otherwise seems inexplicable, is due to their confusion of appearance and essence. Lang and Cooper, like role psychologists, are trapped in the facade which can be adequately presented but not comprehended by positivist logic. The maps and schemes capture the movement of reality, but only after this reality itself has reduced men and women to carriers of signs and symbols. The maps of human relations that they plot are the reified expression of reification. He thinks his wife thinks he's he supposes she loves him. This is the loveless talk of a loveless reality. The move from existentialism to positivism is eased by the facade which is simultaneously both existential and positivist. What is meant by facade is not a false front for the real thing, but a facade in that the social and objective factors are veiled. Exactly because the facade is the immediate reality of human relations in modern society, in exploring it one can claim that one is exploring the existential reality. And exactly because this existential reality is alienated and dehumanized, it can be adequately expressed in positivist schemes. Existentialism and positivism converge when the existential reality is a positivist one. In existentialism, Lang and Cooper find their philosophical roots. It is to the existential tradition, however, that I acknowledge my main intellectual indebtedness. Also to be recalled is that probably the least read book of Lang and Cooper is Reason and Violence, an exposition of Sartre. A discussion of this matter is here impossible. In general, the Sartrean existentialism as filtered through Lang and Cooper does not correct its original weaknesses some of which Marcuse has indicated. One element of this existential tradition can clarify the subjective approach in Lang and Cooper that threatens to swallow the social and objective reality. Lang appeals to Fauerbach as the initiator of the existential discovery of the interpersonal reality. Over a hundred years ago, Fauerbach effected a pivotal step in philosophy. He discovered that philosophy had been exclusively oriented orientated, sorry, around I. No one had realized that the you is as primary as the I. The presence of these others has a profound reactive effect on me. Philosophically, the meaninglessness of the category I without, without its complementary category of you, first stated by Fauerbach, was developed by Martin Buber. Though anyone and everyone can and has been included in the grab bag of existentialism, the appeal to Fauerbach is not incorrect. But Lang and Cooper recapitulate not only the strengths of Fauerbach, but also his failings. His strength is that against the idealism of Hegel, a human and materialistic reality is advanced. Again and again, Fauerbach insists that the starting point of philosophy cannot be philosophy, but the actual life of man. The primary fact in the life of man is the existence of the human community. But in Fauerbach, the same antinomies surface as with Lang, Cooper, and humanist psychologists. The human community shrinks to the immediacy of the I, you encounter, and this is abstracted from the historical and social reality. History for Fauerbach and Fauerbachians turns into anthropology, an invariant. The essence of man, wrote Fauerbach, is contained only in the community and unity of man with man. It is a unity, however, which rests only in the reality of the distinction between I and thou. Or, he wrote, the true dialectic is a dialogue between I and thou. Marx and Engels took Fauerbach to task exactly for the reduction of a social reality to a timeless human encounter. Engels, in a fragment, ridiculed Fauerbach's I-Thou formulation. Philosophy has reached a point when the trivial fact of the inevitability of intercourse between human beings, a fact without knowledge of which the second generation that ever existed would not have been produced, 
a fact already involved in the sexual difference, is presented by philosophy at the end of its entire development as the greatest result. And presented, moreover, in the mysterious form of the unity of I and you, or as Marx and Engels wrote in the German ideology, Farbach conceives of men not in their given social connection, not under their existing conditions of life, which have made them what they are. He never arrives at the really existing men, but stops at the abstraction man. He leaves out the ensemble of the social relations. To be more exact, what is lacking in Farbach is what is lacking in Lang and Cooper. According to Marx and Engels, this is the conception of man as activity, as praxis. It is precisely for this reason that Marx, to follow Marcuse, reaches back beyond Farbach to Hegel. For Hegel, the concept of labor is the irreplaceable element of human history. Here, labor does not merely mean factory work. It means the life praxis of man, objectification in the social world. Labor is the specific mode of activity for human existence. Alienated labor is one form of labor, not labor itself. Because objectification or praxis is lacking in Feuerbach, his theory for all its humanism, its I-thou, is a passive one. It does not comprehend the world as a social environment, the congealed product of human praxis. This failure Lang and Cooper share with Feuerbach. They succumb to the spectacle, the non-activity of watching and viewing and being watched. What Marcuse wrote of Feuerbach could be written of Lang and Cooper. In Feuerbach, man's possession of and relation to the world remains essentially theoretical, and this is expressed in the fact that the way of relating is perception. In Marx, to put it briefly, labor replaces this perception. Although the central importance of the theoretical relationship does not disappear, it is combined with labor in a relationship of dialectical in dialectical interpenetration. The logic of Lang and Cooper's approach to human relations is Feuerbachian. Interpersonal perceptions, images, expectations constitute the fundamental determining structure. They are in no way secondary. In Lang and Cooper, they dislodge the basic mode of appropriation of the world, human praxis. Self-identity, writes Lang, is constituted not only by our looking at ourselves, but also by our looking at others, looking at us. At, at this more complex, more concrete level, self-identity is a, is a synthesis of my looking at me with my view of others' view of me. This is the theory of the spectacle. The passivity of the consumer is elevated into a theory of human identity. Because the means of production and reproduction of life are agents of lifeless capital and profit, life itself seeks refuge in non-activity. Human praxis in this world contracts to you watching me, watching you, watching me. Passive watching is the sanctioned form of relief in a society that has squeezed out the only relief, active human experience. The peep show is no longer the sideshow but with audience participation is society itself. Lang and Cooper elaborate this into a theory of human, not inhuman, relations. Finally, as existence turns into positivism, the reign of things over life, non-dialectical logic knows only one escape, mysticism, spiritualism, and the like. This is an emphatic note in Lang and Cooper. Today, it is part of the zeitgeist. The prevailing forms of reason and reality are confused with reason itself, and it is supposed that the non-rational is an alternative outside of present reality, and in fact not further in it. The assumption that mystification is a response to alienation, inner space to the lack of outer space, would have, was advanced long ago and has gained nothing in the interim. The key to the logic is crystallized in the debate between Marcuse and Norman O. Brown about the latter's love, the latter's love's body. Brown wrote in a, in a rebuttal to Marcuse's review, the alternative to reification is mystification. This is the crux of the matter. 
To critical theory, mystification is the complement to reification, not its dissolution. It seeks to trick away reification by using reification's own tricks. To make things dance before the eyes while society limps along. If our time has been distinguished by an almost total forgetfulness of the internal world, to follow Lang, it is not to be called to life by forgetting the outer world that forgot the inner one. The promise of the universal unleashing of a, of a full spirituality will turn into a universally controlled and programmed reality if it is not translated into social praxis. Occultism, wrote Adorno, is the complement of reification. When the objective world appears to the living as blinder than ever before, they attempt to find meaning in it by abracadabra. Today, half-serious mystics vie with totally serious ones. Stars, signs, gurus interpret a world of capitalist hieroglyphics. The messages from the stars inadvertently tell the truth. The daily fate and plight is irrational. It is in the stars. Hence, it soothes those who suspect that life is as predetermined as it actually is by shifting the blame from the social to natural and supernatural reality. But today, the cults are a response not only to a cold and bleak society, but to a political and cultural left that promised too much too fast. Those who banked everything on a revolution now were left with nothing when the time schedule changed. A law to be formulated? Mystical politics produces mysticism without politics. The very recent interviews with Lang suggest this progression. Not to be forgotten is the strength of the writing of Lang and Cooper. In a period when reason is mad, madness has its reason. Lang, Cooper, and their collaborators have em- emphasized this insight. But, but, as he has been, but as has been argued here, this has more and more eroded into a parenthesis in a text of pop existentialism, positivism, and spiritualism. The text itself loses the tension between theory and therapy and advances notions of human identity and relations that take the mutilated wrecks that people the social landscape of, as specimens of a future humanity. Endless talk on... Endless talk on I and thou forgets that neither can be created out of endless talk. The writings of Lang and Cooper more and more suggest the confusion of psychic first aid with liberation. To read successively Freud, the Neo-Freudians, and the Post-Freudians is to witness the effect of social amnesia, the repression of critical thought. The vital relationship between mind and memory turns malignant. Oblivion and novelty feed off each other and flourish. Psychoanalytic and critical thought is, is sloughed off in the name of progress, which is regression. What has been called the death and rebirth of psychology, referring to the reemergence of a spiritualized psychology since the demise of the old Freudian materialism, is exactly the reverse, the loss of a critical psychology. The spiritualities of the conformists, the blind materialism of the behaviorists, the superficial humanism and confused existentialism, the rampant subjectivism. These are elements of a consciousness that no longer coheres. In this situation, critical theory is loyal to its content. Critique and theory, negative psychoanalysis and a non-subjective theory of subjectivity. It resists the lure of the immediate which becomes irresistible as society hardens and rigidifies and it works to preserve its alienation from an alienated society. Um, Neurofremdite ist das Gegengift gegen and <laughs> I am so sorry to German people. And from Dung. The fuck. Uh, wrote Adorno. Only distance is the antidote to estrangement. I should have just read the English part instead of embarrassing me- myself with the German pronunciation. The whole is the truth, and the whole is false. These are not mere theoretical statements derived from Marx and Hegel. The madness and irrationality of the whole are so apparent, so evident, and so total that those who glimpse its full unreason are struck dumb by it. Their failing is not to understand what is not to be understood. It is left to the others to talk for them. No one is immune. 
Madness haunts the working and sleeping hours of even the most healthy and normal as society loses even the appearance of rationality. Liberation is so close that it can almost be tasted. <coughs> and it is no longer comprehensible why it is not here. Those who repress this evoke the discipline and values of the past, the values that form the prehistory of the crisis, not its negation. Those who sense the nearness and distance of liberation tolerate the contradiction only with the great, greatest strain, <coughs> especially in periods of political retreat. They are threatened with despair and resignation. A critical psychology must not succumb. It must not forget the madness of the whole and ideologically flaunt the virtues of a human existence that is today inhuman. It must aid the victims, the lost, the beaten, the hopeless, without glorifying them. Shortly before the apparatus of law and order unleashed its bullets on the inmates and guards at Attica State Prison, a prisoner was reported as saying, We are the only civilized men here. A psychology that is to be neither the cynical tool of adjustment nor the sincere but vacuous exponent of growth and sensitivity must reflect on that statement. <laughs>